So in my video earlier, I was actually showing you chroma filters. Here is a, you know, just a rough graph that gives you a sense of the number of wavelengths that are allowed to pass given the red, green, and blue filters, as well as a luminance filter here, and an example of a narrowband filter, which is the hydrogen alpha here. Um, it's shown in uh, orange, but it, you know, it's actually quite red, right? So you can see that they're fairly well defined. I mean, we have the blue here, and then we have some overlap with green, which I'll get back to, much less overlap. Only these wavelengths here are the greenish wavelengths of light. It overlaps much, a very, very small amount with the red. This is very distinct. And then all the red wavelengths fall in this area here. So this is the, the band, if you will. It's these um, ranges of wavelengths here. And the transmission, as far as its efficiency is concerned, is in the vertical direction. So we have the transmission percentage is what it's labeled as here. 100%, well, that would be pretty good because that's perfect. Uh, that, of course, doesn't happen. No, you don't expect to get 100% transmission. But you can get pretty close with the very high-quality filters. You will notice here that we have a luminance filter, and it very closely aligns with the combination, if you will, of the red, green, and blue, which means that if you use luminance, you're going to be color coloring everything that you otherwise detected in each of the individual color channels. It is the same regime. Also keep in mind what we're not seeing here is that a sensor has its own sensitivity and it has its own range of, uh, if you will, the ability to detect various wavelengths of light, a response to light. So that's not being shown here just because we get this transmission through doesn't mean that this is actually the curve that we would expect to see when we include the sensor as well. So you can get plots like this that show the combined overall responsiveness of a system at any particular wavelength of light. Uh, but this is what the filters do. And let me spend a moment and talk about the narrowband ones, because that's what we're interested in. Here we have the narrowband. Uh, oh, this is where the HA line is. So HA is a very particular emission. It is an um, electronic emission of the hydrogen gas. When it is excited at a particular level, you get a very particular wavelength of light, specific wavelength of light being emitted. So we don't, if we want to just look at that wavelength, we don't need a broadband filter. We only need to capture a very small range and let just those photons through. But here's an interesting point I would like to um, start to hint at because it will help explain something uh, that we do when we, um, you know, take advantage of narrowband filters. If we were looking at an object, let's say that we, you know, we take a picture of this object, and I'm just going to pick one. It may not be the example, uh, best example, but I'm going to say the Horsehead Nebula, right? We take a picture of the Horsehead Nebula, just the Horsehead, right, or the region around the Horsehead. I'm not talking about some of the, the nearby nebulosity, but uh, just the region around the Horsehead. You know, there's no blue nebulosity at all. There's just no photons that are bluish, and maybe the stars, but I'm talking about the nebula. There's no nebula blue photons coming to us at all. So in the blue filter, the nebula basically disappears. That's also basically true in the green filter. Uh, and then in the red filter, certainly we're letting those photons that are being emitted by the nebula come through. And they are mostly being generated by the hydrogen gas at this very particular wavelength of light. So now let me say the following. Let's say you're under a dark sky, right? And you go take a picture with your red filter of the Horsehead Nebula. You expose for some certain period of time. And then you take another picture with a hydrogen alpha filter. Same nebula, same telescope, same sensor, same all things. What's going to be the difference between those two pictures? You're under a dark sky. That's the key here. And what I'm going to argue is that mostly there's very little difference at all. So just the fact that we're using a hydrogen alpha filter does not change the overall intensity of the nebula, right? We're letting pass through the same wavelengths of light. And if that nebula is only emitting at a very particular wavelength of light, we capture that with our broadband filter just the same as we do with the narrowband filter. So there isn't a difference if we were to actually count the photons and assuming that the transmissions were very similar, we would expect to see the nebula 
at roughly the same brightness. So just keep that in mind for a moment. Now, I know that in your brain, you might be thinking, well, why in the world do those you know, hydrogen alpha pictures look so much better in some sense? And I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But there's two reasons, there's two big effects that narrowband filters have. Let me just also point over here, why didn't this, um, whoever made this graph, why didn't they also put, for example, like the O3, just for fun? Um, because, I think, that if you put the O3 narrowband filter, it falls in the same place that there is this overlap between the green and the blue. So this overlap between in the green and the blue is actually done on purpose by filter manufacturers, made popular actually by uh, Don Goldman some time ago, because it used to be there was this more defined difference uh, when you bought filters between the green and the blue filters, and it depended on the filter manufacturer as to whether that line, the O3 line, appeared green or blue. It just depended on which of the two filters it fell in. And how this affected people didn't affect you when you took a picture of the Triffid Nebula. It had no effect at all. But if you took a picture of a planetary nebula, an object that you know emitted light almost exclusively, or very strongly so, in the O3, then that object would either be green or blue, depending upon where the line fell in whichever filter was transmitting that particular color of light. And that, if you took the, if you didn't manipulate your image, then you would end up with a blue planetary nebula or a green one. And it would be either primary blue or primary green. It wouldn't be this in-between nice teal color. So by having this overlap, by putting, if you're looking at a, an object that is emitting at the O3 wavelength, which is right here, it's at 500 something um, nanometers, then you have an equal uh, amount of signal in both the blue and the green filters so that when you combine your color channels, you end up with a blue-green color. You end up with that teal color, which is, of course, what these nebulas are emitting. They're emitting in both, this blue and the green, as defined by filters as we normally do here with blue and green, these particular ranges. So that's why there's this overlap and much less overlap over here. The more overlap you have between these, and I'm going to demonstrate this in a moment, the less contrast you're going to get with colors because the more they fall, uh, the more overlap you have between the filters, the more photons fall in both buckets. As you combine them, you'll get intermediate colors, but with enough overlap, you get coloration that is closer to white, right? Because if it is showing up in each of the filters, then uh, there is no discrimination between, there's less discrimination between those wavelengths, and so you have less color contrast. Now that we've considered the idea of the transmission of light through a filter where we start with some amount of light, a little bit less goes through. Now we can uh, look at actual data here where I have hydrogen alpha data on the left and I have a red filter data on the right, the broader filter. First, let me just talk about the stars. So a stars, of course, emit in all colors of light. Now they may emit more red than blue and they gives us their different colorations, but they are continuum. Uh, emitters of light, which means they emit all colors of light effectively, regardless of what uh, the degree of brightness. We're going to see all the colors there represented, right? And so when we look at these two images, the hydrogen alpha here on the left, it looks like there are fewer stars. Now, I haven't stretched these images yet, so the stars that we're seeing are just the ones that are nearly saturated, but it is, it's the same field. It's the same stars. So why is it that we see brighter stars over here? Let's assume for a second that these two filters have approximately the same transmission. They, you know, if you send in a certain amount of light, they all pass that particular wavelength of light. Well, it's just because then this is the broader filter. This lets more colors through, and so we have a brighter image. We have more stars that are going to be showing up the image. That's just because of the filter itself it allows more wavelengths of light photons to actually come through. Now, with regards to the nebula, it's different. Because just consider for a moment that this is a hydrogen alpha filter here. The nebula itself, which you can't see, I'm going to show it to you in a moment, it is the crescent nebula, is emitting in one wavelength of light. The same wavelength that the red filter, it passes that wavelength, but so does the hydrogen alpha filter. It passes the same wavelength. And if these two uh, images, if these two filters, I should say, have the same transmission ability to pass the same amount of light, you know, 90%, whatever, 
is the nebula going to appear any different in terms of its brightness? And the answer is no, because it's still letting the same photons through, whether we have a wide band or a narrow band. So let's actually examine that for a moment and see what that looks like. So I'm going to do an auto stretch here. This is on the red filter. And then I'm going to do an auto stretch here on the hydrogen alpha filter. And you can certainly see a difference. Now, it is unfortunate that um, the comparison that I'm about to make, this is an older set of data, and it originally was binned two by two. So the, both the resolution and the brightnesses between these two images are, are not matched exactly. But I think the point that I'm about to make should still come across. And that is that the main difference between when we look at a, a narrow band filtered image is that it's the brightness of the sky that matters. It's the sky brightness that ultimately determines the contrast and therefore the amount of nebulosity that we see. We're not seeing extra nebulosity because of the hydrogen alpha filter. We're, we're able to see that nebulosity with more contrast because we've removed the brightness of the sky. It's the sky photons that the red filter lets through that really causes, a, really causes us a big problem. Now, I'm ignoring the stars. That's a different thing. The stars being continuum emitters are going to be different brightnesses because they emit all colors of light, but so does the sky, and it's the sky itself that's the issue. Let me just show you what I mean. If I put my cursor here, these are two integrated stacked images, right? I can look at this brightness of the sky that reveals the nebula, you know, in this, uh, to this degree. So the brightness of the sky is 0 0.002 or 0 0.003 or so, right? So what happens if I make this image, if I display this uh, histogram in exactly the same way? See, this is being displayed with an auto setting, which is choosing, let's zoom in here, some black level to be at 0 0.01. But if we set it way down here to, what did I say, 0 0.002 or 3, I guess, 0 0.003, there we go. And then I try to make the nebula, you know, similar brightness, but it's going to be somewhere around here. You see, now I'm displaying them in a way where I am showing you how bright the sky is with respect to the nebula, because I now have these sky brightnesses set to the same level, 0 0.001 or 2, whatever it is. So it looks like a higher contrast here because the sky with respect to the nebula is much greater here, not showing those photons, if you will, than it is in this image over here. That's the big benefit that a narrow band filter can give you. Now, if I took this image here in the red filter under a darker sky, my red image, you'd want to ignore the stars, right? I'm only talking about the nebula because the nebula is emitting most strongly at the hydrogen alpha particular color of light. This image is going to start to look much more like this image. You wouldn't need a narrow band filter if we didn't need to subtract the sky. We could get rid of the sky, ignore those sky photons. Uh, but that's not the case usually because even in the darkest places in the world, the sky does have a brightness. There's air glow and other... Um, you know, attributes of the sky that, you know, light pollution, everything else, that will always mean the sky has a, a certain amount of emission that we are going to detect. So uh, these narrow band filters, like this hydrogen alpha filter, really does give us that contrast, but it's mostly because we're making the sky very dark. So I'm going to stick with this for just a moment. Again, this is not going to be a perfect example, but if I look at the same bit of nebulosity... Uh, let's d drag this over to here, like this. And let's say we look at uh, this feature right here is the same as this feature right here. Now, it looks brighter here than it is here, but it's not. That's, that is just a contrast adjustment, right? If I put my cursor here, this is 0 0.05. If I put my cursor here, this is 0 0.02. So what's going on? Well, what's going on here is we're looking at a contribution of brightness that is the sky plus the nebula. If I subtract the sky from this image, literally, if I go to, and what is the value here? Because I did this already. It's a point of, yeah, point zero one eight basically. So if I come to process and I do pixel math here, I think I have it set up already. Yeah, there it is. So I say target T minus point zero one eight. That's the sky. Subtract the sky. Now this looks terrible, right? Because I've just subtracted the sky, uh, and it's probably a bit of an over subtraction. 
Uh, but that should give you a sense that now if I put my cursor here, should this value equal this? I'm going to claim roughly yes. That's what should happen. Uh, but it won't be exact here because, again, I was using a binned image and blah, 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 blah. But it'll be much closer. Now you'll see this says 0.02, uh, you know, basically 0.03. This one here is 0.023, 0.024, whatever. Uh, you can see that they're closer. Uh, so that's the main point that I want to take away, uh, that I want to make, is that we have the stars, which are continuum emitters. So they're going to vary in their brightness just because we're just, uh, depending upon the, how broad your filter is, determines how bright those stars appear, uh, because they just emit all colors of light. But when you look at a, an emission band, an, an emission uh, of a, an object that is just emitting one particular color of light, um, like the nebula here, then it doesn't matter if we're looking through a broad band or a narrow band image. The brightness of the nebula is, should be the same, given that there's the same transmission through these filters. The only reason we see these big differences is how much of the sky that we're rejecting, that we're not seeing when we look with a narrow band filter. Okay, so now we can come back to this graph where again you can see that the hydrogen alpha filter is much, much more narrow than the red filter. That's a much broad band, much broader band filter, right? However, even narrow band filters themselves have different widths. So you can purchase different widths of filters. Now, this is a graph that's plotted by uh, on cloudy nights, I believe that the individual here is John Upton. He made these graphs where he's basically just looking at the, the top of the, the peak here uh, for different filters that you can purchase. Say, say the hydrogen alpha filter here, uh, they actually come in different widths themselves. So notice how small the numbers are here. We're going from 654 to 658. You know, we're looking at three or four or five or whatever nanometers here. So we're not, uh, we're not looking at a big range. We're looking at a small range. And this will show you, you know, not only the difference in transmission between them, but the different widths of the filters as well. You can see here where we have kind of like the three nanometer, then we have a four or five nanometer width for these hydrogen alpha filters. The transmissions are fairly similar to one another, but now you know, and I, what I tried to indicate is that the wider the, the width of even a narrow band filter will just determine uh, for the most part, it'll control how bright those stars appear. There's also a consideration that comes with the fact that the more narrow your filter is, the more it is sensitive to uh, a different angle of the light that's incident on the filter. So you want to keep that in mind as well. Now, John makes another comment here that is interesting in that uh, for a slightly wider hydrogen alpha band filter, it will pass another red line, which is the nitrogen 2 line, which means that you're actually getting two emissions through your filter, uh, but it's going to still be at the expense of, you know, brighter stars, although five nanometers is still very, very narrow. So uh, still going to have, uh, your stars aren't going to be that bright. Uh, the same thing applies, of course, when you look at the O3 filter um, and the S2 filters. So just so you know, they do come in different bandwidths, and it's something that you need to consider when you're purchasing your filters.